Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of HBCU Huddle. I am CJ Hurt. Joined alongside, as always, Mike Wallace. Mike, what's going on, man? Hey, what's going on, CJ, man? Looking forward to another great show. It's always a lot happening this time of the year, man. And uh, it's good to have HBCU Huddle back in the middle of Black History Month, fresh off of our HBCU night with the Memphis Grizzlies. Successful night. And uh, just looking forward to more to come. Oh, it was it was an incredible night, Mike. Um, we saw some some super talented uh, young people getting a chance out there to perform. You were at the panel as well, if yeah. I remember correctly. How was it for you? No, the panel was great, man. We were at the uh, the Old Daisy Theater, and mm. you know it's a remarkable uh, group of uh, young business women women who are uh, reviving the Old Daisy. So that historic venue uh, played host to our HBCU night panel discussion where we talked about legacy, life, and and the future uh, of HBCUs. And, you know, was happy to have uh, Dr. Glover from Tennessee State, the outgoing uh, president mm-hmm. of Tennessee State, uh, was on the panel. Um, and it was just a phenomenal, we had a representative from Lamont Owen. We also had, uh, you know, a representative from Pinnacle Bank um, and Aaron Pittman, our HBCU intern, uh, working over in community engagement as well there too. So, you know, phenomenal panel. We talked about a lot of great things involving HBCUs and where we've gone, where we've come from, where we are, and where we need to head, uh, specifically from an economic development standpoint. So great time. And then I know you were uh, there to tip off the game, man, in terms of playing a little bit of the game night operations, uh, you know, bringing in HBCU night during that game uh, last, uh, I guess it was what, last Thursday now. Yep. It was, it was, it was great. It's always great. I love seeing everybody come through with their HBCU gear. I know that HBCUs are national and international, but every now and then seeing like a, a Langston hat jacket combination throws me for a loop. It's like, wait, <laughs> ah, never seen one of those. And why I love seeing it. It's, yeah. it's great. And then the, the feel of it was great. Uh, Mississippi Valley state did the, the halftime show and they mm-hmm. were, they were incredible. That band was, was phenomenal. And it was just – it's always so much fun. Any chance you get uh, to come to a Grizzlies game is going to be fun. But when they throw that HBCU flavor on top of it, it's, it's just great. I, I can't say enough glowing things about that night, man. Yeah, and each game, each game, the Grizzlies have, I believe, six more home games uh, in the month of February. And each night, uh, the, the Memphis Grizzlies and the, the Grizzlies Community Foundation Community Engagement Team will be honoring – uh, an empowerment award winner uh, from an HBCU alum, an alum from an HBCU will be honored, uh, where they will be matching uh, scholarship and salary, uh, uh, not salary, but scholarship money to go to the school uh, that they went to. So we got six more people to honor from our community who are HBCU alums who are doing great things uh, within the Memphis and the greater Memphis community. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. And, and that's every single home game in the month of February. And I've said it on this show before, if you've missed it, <coughs> if you come to a Grizzlies game, excuse me, if you come to a mm-hmm. Grizzlies game, go up to the tippity top. I think that's the terrace level and walk mm-hmm. around. There's some incredible artwork by some local artists in the Memphis area. You don't want to miss it. And I do believe they still have the interactive art exhibit down on the right when you walk into FedEx form, the opening gates. We've got a lot to get to, as always, on this show. Let's start with Morehouse. I do believe this is, I might be mistaken, if I am, forgive me, but I think this is the last coaching hire of the hiring, (laughs) firing season. Um, Morehouse was rumored to be interested in Hugh Jackson. We talked about that either last week or two weeks ago. They ended up going with Terrence Mathis to be their next head coach. Mike uh, Mathis, you brought it up. He played for the Falcons uh, in the NFL, so he's one of those types of, of guys that seems to be a trend amongst HBCUs right now to go out and get former all pros and all uh, uh, all stars or pro bowlers, excuse me, to come through and come back and, and coach. And Terrence Mathis fits that bill. He was a coordinator somewhere for a while. And in the past, since like from 2017 to 2019, he was at Pinecrest, Pinecrest, excuse me, Pinecrest Academy, where he went seven and 25. Morehouse has won 13 games total. The past five seasons, I don't get this higher necessarily, Mike. What say you? Um, I, I get it. I get it. You know, it's it's Morehouse, and any time that they can have a chance to, you know, raise their profile by bringing in a former NFL player who knows the Atlanta area, knows the Atlanta market, 
um, you know, understands that you can recruit at the Division II level a little bit differently um, than, than you do at some of the higher levels of college football. And it, it's a splash. You know what I mean? It's a relevant hire for them. Uh, for him, it, it gives him a legitimate college coaching job. And it's at the HBCU ranks on the Division II. But if you can do anything at Morehouse to restore that that program uh, to some level of competitive uh, fire and, and, and give them some reason to want to cover and come out and fans to come support Morehouse football, then, you know, then you're, you've done your job. So I can understand for him, it's an opportunity to raise his profile, his resume, build it a little bit more. And for Morehouse, it gives them a chance, like I said before, uh, to make a splash because the trend is to go get someone with NFL experience, either as a player or a coach and see if that can uplift your fan base and invigorate your student body and give them something to come out and support it. I, will Hugh Jackson not have been a bigger splash to you, Mike? Because that's, that's where I'm I'm confused at because I, I think that while Terrence Mathis is, is certainly someone people, especially in the Georgia Atlanta area, would recognize, I think mm-hmm. that more people would recognize Hugh Jackson at this point in time. Yeah, I, I think so, you know, from that standpoint. But I, I also don't know what Hugh Jackson's demands would have been, right? Okay. I think he comes from a situation where he was, you know, coaching a head coach at the NFL. You know, that comes with million-dollar expectations and expectations of a certain standard of training facilities and all those kind of things. Then he went down to the college level uh, where he's been at the big-time level and has also, also been at the HBCU level. He was at Tennessee State for a year. And what Tennessee State has in terms of facilities, you and I were just there. It's not, you know, great or ideal, but it certainly is better than what Morehouse is going to have. So I think I think Hugh probably wanted a little bit more or came to expect or would have been entitled to a little bit more than maybe what Terrence uh, Mathis is coming in looking at. So, you know, it's one of those things where we'll see where it goes. But Morehouse definitely has to step their game up because the coach that they just let go of, uh, came out and said, hey, I, I was sold a, a, a fake bill of goods in terms mm-hmm. of the kind of support and resources that I was going to get at this university. And this guy didn't have a high profile name. So I think Hugh maybe came with a little bit more than what Morehouse was willing to uh, to invest in right now. Um, that's not to say that that Terrence standards are lower. It's just that, you know, it's easier to get a guy in who's not going to come in and, and have to have that sense of entitlement that Hugh may have. Yeah, I, I guess when you look at it like that, that yeah. that makes sense. The the Hugh Jackson component of this though is one that is really really interesting to me. Hugh Jackson was let go uh, at Grambling State after two years, two losing seasons at Grambling. He was like you said, offensive coordinator three years ago at Tennessee State before he took that Grambling job. It seems like people are hands off on on Hugh Jackson. I don't know if it's mm-hmm. people or if it's just the the job he applied to. He ended up not getting. Would do you think Hugh Jackson will coach again, a head coach or a head coach at an HBCU spot specifically? And would you want Hugh Jackson on your coaching staff as offensive coordinator or something like I, that? I think he does. I think I think uh, Hugh Jackson does have a future uh, in the coaching game. I, I think he might have to circle back uh, into the coordinator ranks again and, and sort of build himself up. I think he does know what he's doing uh, from an offensive standpoint. Um, and he needs, to, he needs to go someplace where there is some stability. So I do think there is coaching in his future. Sometimes when guys just kind of stay at, were at this level and then had to take a job at this level and then had to take another job at this level, um, sometimes it makes more sense to take a year off and to regroup as opposed to keep going down a peg. And, and I, I think the trajectory of Hughes' career was going straight down. And I think he needed to, uh, I think he needed to change that trajectory a little bit and maybe taking a year off and then resetting rebuilding some relationships. There's a lot of movement in the NFL. Maybe he goes back to being a quarterback's coach somewhere at that level if he's not going to be a coordinator at the college level and then reset it from there. He's almost in the same or a similar kind of scenario, you know, that uh, Fred McNair is in right now. You know, the job market didn't dictate or necessitate some place where he have a soft landing spot. So maybe he has to take a year off, regroup, refresh, um, maybe go get some more training, maybe go to some seminars and and do some coaching, uh, speaking engagements and build his uh, network a little bit more and then jump back in next year. Because, you know, one thing that the NFL, college football, all the way down the ranks is going to offer is more opportunity the following year because someone is always on yeah. the hot seat. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to stay with Morehouse. I saw some some rumors. 
I couldn't like find anything to cor- corroborate what was going on on social media. A mm-hmm. D two HBCU football guy on Twitter, Mo Carter and others, friend of the show, Mo Carter, um, and and others were talking about the potential for a Morehouse to the MEAC um, sort of move. Now Mo points this out, and D two HBCU football guy also pointed it out. If me if the MEAC could get Morehouse right in this mm-hmm. hypothetical scenario. They'd have the number seven market. They'd have the number 22 and the number 29 market, right? They'd have, um, I think, Charlotte, Atlanta, Baltimore, and D.C. So they'd have four major markets in the top 30. I just don't see, for me personally, I don't think Morehouse has made the commitment to sports, not just football, but to sports in general, uh, to warrant them being able to make a jump up. I also don't think that there is recklessly speculating, no ties in Morehouse. Sure as hell doesn't feel like it is a priority to be good at sports. Now, we know what sports can do, Mike. We know how sports drives not just revenue to your school, but Mm -hmm. bodies to your school in terms of more students applying, more students enrolling at your university. Sports does that for Mm -hmm. you. So it is it, it goes hand in hand. Where if you have a good athletic department, specifically a good football team, you pro- you're you going to see an increase in, re- in enrollment, an increase in donors, and an increase in money overall coming to your university. And Morehouse just does not strike me as a university that is really interested in sports in that way. And you have to be if you're going to make a jump like that from D2 to FCS. What they do have, though, what Morehouse does have is the tradition. What it does have is the the, the national brand of a name. So it is like a name. Howard, it is a brand. What, what Howard has. Um, and, and when you look at resources and facilities, Howard doesn't have strong football resources and facilities. Um, Delaware State, you know, apologies and, and, and no disrespect to Kyra. You know, nah, they don't have they don't have, they don't have uh, strong facilities when it comes to athletics. Um, they play basically in a high school type. Uh, a, a basketball facility, um, and, and it's definitely, a, a, I don't want to say a joke of a football facility, but it's nowhere near a college football uh, or stadium that they have. You know what I mean? I've seen middle schools, um, you know, with better high school, but with better football facilities than, than what you see at Delaware State. So, you know, they can, they can what, what, what the MEAC wants is a business partner where they can tap into the Atlanta market and mm-hmm. say, you know what? We can host the MEAC and MEAC basketball tournaments yep. in Atlanta. You know, we can go in and have a championship game, potentially a conference championship game or a preseason, not a preseason, but a kickoff game uh, in Atlanta using Morehouse. And then Morehouse is going to have to have some uh, ability to increase their scholarship numbers uh, from the 60 to the 85 limit, I think, uh, is what they need to get to uh, or, or, or up to the 63 limit. And at the very least, if they're not even there yet. Um, and then build from there. So, you know, you have different avenues where you can fast track Morehouse if they're serious at all about wanting to do this. But if you're the me, I, I definitely see and understand if you're going to target schools, you have to target markets. Um, they have they have the D.C. market, obviously, with Howard and Baltimore. I mean, uh, Morgan State and Baltimore um, and, and also Howard with D.C. They have that Tidewater area with Hampton. Well, used to have Hampton, but Norfolk State still uh, now. But beyond that. I mean, they really don't have much. South Carolina State is in a small market. They don't really have the Charlotte market uh, because North Carolina a t is in Greensboro, and they're not even in the MEAC anymore. So mm-hmm. they're struggling when it comes to that. If you can bring in Atlanta, that gives you access to another market that you could tap into. And the most notable uh, HBCU that's in Atlanta is Morehouse. So I guess by, by process of elimination and deductive reasoning, you got to go for them if the speculation is anywhere near true. If you're the MEAC, you have to build that conference back up. Uh, to sustainability a couple of things who else, who else would you go for like if, if you look at it and and, and again you know the, the the pickings are slim if you're going to stay yeah. in hbcu now if you're going to step outside of hbcus and you're going to invite some teams that might be interested in coming that's a different scenario altogether but if you're going to stay within the hbcu ranks um you know I, it's it's I, I don't know where else where, where would you go i i think that you're right First off, you want to get into Atlanta and so you can say, hey, we can host a kickoff here or we can host a men's basketball, women's basketball tournament here because this is a large city with a bunch of HBCU alums. Mm -hmm. You can do that without Morehouse, though. 
right? Like you, you can the the MEAC can decide today. Hey, we'll find the venue, do all the work and everything, and then say, hey, you know what? The 2025 uh, MEAC men's basketball tournament will be in Atlanta, Georgia, and it. I don't know how adding Morehouse adds more to that. Because I don't, well, I'm not sure if the support is there. You kind of have a host institution there. You okay. know what I mean? Like they do the uh, the, the basketball tournament annually or, or mostly in um, whether well, for a long time has been at Norfolk, you know, Norfolk right. State and Norfolk has hosted it. You know, you've had it in Baltimore or D.C. before. So, OK, so I'm, I'm sorry, Mike, not to cut you off, but you're saying you would host it on Morehouse's campus. No, 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 no. You just okay. have to host it somewhere in that city, because gotcha. right now I don't think Morehouse could 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 host they they, their facility wouldn't be able to host a MEAC basketball tournament so you might have to host it somewhere like a Georgia Tech or you know some uh uh, the Cobb County Civic Center or some kind of municipal place where you put a basketball court inside of an arena um you know to at least get five to seven thousand fans there right so you could just like uh the MEAC hosted uh uh the baseball tournament in Atlanta uh last year and they did it at Georgia Tech's um uh, facility and they didn't have a team there you know in Atlanta that was just a good spot to host it at but if you have a host team there that you can sort of build up um to help you there that that would be uh, in, in a more ideal situation only other place I can think of would be if you want to go get Virginia State or Virginia Union but I'm not sure if Richmond does anything more for you and when you already have Norfolk and the Tidewater area yeah. plus DC so if you can get into that Charlotte you know or uh, uh, Charlotte area um, I could see that, but Johnson C. Smith, is that big enough? Is that going to do it? Um, Durham, um, you already have North Carolina Central yeah. in Durham. So I don't know how much more, you know, you you you, you can play with. I think you got to go south, if not back into Florida um, and get maybe like a uh, 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 Edward Waters. But I don't think they're big enough yet either. So if yeah, you and that's that's Florida, that's the thing, Mike, like, when you when yeah. you're talking about trying to add some of these D2 schools. It's not many that are are big enough. Winston right. Salem State was up there, and then they they recently came Went back, back down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that would be an an option for for me. You asked me a while back what schools I would target. Winston Salem yeah. State, but again, they were up. Now they're back down. I think you try and go after somebody who's already up. So already a FCS school, already D one. I, I still think you try and make a play for Tennessee State. That might be a little far from a travel standpoint, but so is Morehouse and in that regard. And so is anybody mm-hmm. else you're going to to add for Delaware State, Norfolk State, Howard and and uh, Morgan State. Right. So I, I don't think that is a a real drawback. Um, but yeah, Morehouse Spellman, because I, I would assume and that's the other part of this. I would assume you'd bring Spellman also to, to balance things out when time comes for, like, conference schedule for both the men's and the women's. But mm-hmm. I'm not sure how that would play out. But, yeah, Morehouse, because of the Atlanta market, I, I'm i partial. I think Tuskegee could do well moving up. And there is a passionate fan base. And this is the thing, this is the knock I have with Morehouse. The The passion might be there. The passion is there because passion follows uh, these universities around. But is it big enough, right? Like, there is a... Tuskegee travels well, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit, but Morehouse really doesn't when you look at what they do athletically. And so I think that Tuskegee could fit. Now the issue with Tuskegee is it's in the middle of nowhere, Alabama. You're not going to get a a major TV market. You could say, well, maybe you get into the Montgomery market. Atlanta's not that far away. Maybe you can tap in there as well. But honestly, like you, if you could combine – the passion and the willingness to travel from Tuskegee fans, plus the market size of Morehouse, that would be the the dream. But you've got yeah. one here and you got the other one there, and then you throw in Winston-Salem State, you bring up the two uh, Virginia schools as well. It's You've got to get creative in the MEAC, and I do not envy uh, the <laughs> commissioner, Sonia Seals, in the, in the least trying to figure this out. But here's the thing, you make a good point. Like, you know, Tuskegee will travel a lot better than what Morehouse traditionally would, right? But flip it on the other side. If you're at, you know, if, if you're at, uh, let's just say North Carolina Central and your student body and your fan base, they'd love to take a trip down to Atlanta to play Morehouse. Yeah. Like it, it's a good weekend trip, right? Yeah. Um, no matter where you are. So other teams are going to want to come to Atlanta because it's an easy place to get to and it's a fun place to get to. 
uh, where you spend a weekend and those kind of things. So maybe Morehouse doesn't have the 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 national pull uh, to take your, their fan base on the road. Howard didn't necessarily either. Um, however, you know, you, you definitely will have other fans and other teams wanting to get to Atlanta to see a game uh, at Morehouse if Morehouse is hosting. The other question is where will they play the home games too? They have to get a bigger stadium and a, and a more uh, conducive uh, place to play football for it to be meaningful whatsoever. If if that is the case, there's going to have to be an investment in the MEAC and the MEAC schools helping to uplift whatever HBCU they target to have to bring up from a Division two to the uh, FCS level, no matter what. It's not going to be only on that school to do it. It's going to have to take all of the collective MEAC schools to want to put some kind of investment uh, in the infrastructure to make that deal work. Absolutely, absolutely it will. This is a Morehouse heavy show today. I don't know mm-hmm. if I said that. Mm-hmm. Let's continue talking about uh, Morehouse. The Tuskegee Morehouse Classic, Mike. It is returning yeah. to Columbus. For those of you who don't know, the Tuskegee Morehouse Classic used to be played in Columbus, and then I think 2021 was the year they decided to move it to Birmingham. And so it was, it's was. it been in Birmingham the past couple of years. I can't find anything, again, like – credible anything like that as to why it's leaving Birmingham but uh in the presser yesterday or Wednesday I don't know when you're watching this in the presser on Wednesday there were talks about or or a quick mention about the fact that hey Tuskegee travels well Morehouse really doesn't and Morehouse didn't travel to Birmingham and it was difficult for them to you know, fill that stadium or to get the vibe right in that stadium. Whereas in Columbus, like you could take a bus from Atlanta to Columbus and bring mm-hmm. those those HBCU fans on through. So I'm glad that it's back in Columbus. My mama stays in Columbus. It's one of her favorite events of the year. Peter Bowden, uh, excuse me, Peter Bowden, excuse me, president and CEO of Visit Columbus said during the presser that historically this particular classic, the Morehouse Tuskegee Classic, brings in about eight hundred thousand dollars to the Columbus area. And that's that's huge when you think about the size of these institutions and you think mm-hmm. about the the passion that follows them around nationally. Uh, Mike, I, I'm selfishly excited, glad that is back uh, in Columbus. It feels like it fits. But I wonder, what does this say to you about just the state of trying to start new classics or to change uh, traditions with some of these classics? We, we're we dealing with it right now with the Southern Heritage Classic and the decision that Jackson State made to pull out and bring in Pine Bluff. Yeah, great point. Great point. And, and, and when you set that, that topic up, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head because to me, when it moved to Birmingham, it just felt like another game. Right. Yeah. The, the Birmingham already has the the uh, Magic City Classic, mm-hmm. which is the one that everyone invests in because it's the bigger classic with the two bigger state HBCU schools. And it just felt like it was a stepchild and, and it, it didn't deserve. Whereas in Columbus, it was the game. Right. It was the game uh, going on that year, every year that that city, uh, that community rallied around. Uh, because it was a meeting place for for those two schools that was easy it was almost like a border rivalry type situation mm-hmm. and it defined what that 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 city's uh hbcu legacy uh was all about so it needed to go back um but i also understand holding these promoters these cities these municipalities to a different standard because college football and college athletics they are evolving there is more money that goes into it you can't just take for granted that people are going to continue to flock and do the same things. You have to be able to uh, adjust economically. You got to be able to put the resources into the infrastructure and the facilities, and you have to be able to increase the pay for these schools to want to come uh, continue to come. It is a moneymaker. That's what these classics are all about. It's a, it's about making money. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, Fred Jones at, at the Southern Heritage Classic understood that as well. And, you know, Deion Sanders and what Jackson State did, you know, basically held a reality check and said, listen, we can hold these games on our own campuses and, and make the money ourselves. We don't have to split it or, or have to feel like there's a split. We can come up with our own and cut out the middleman. And I think that was a wake up call in a sense uh, to the Southern Heritage Classic, even though as much as that game means to Memphis. So having said all of that, you know, I think this game, I know how much I know how many Morehouse fans that are in the Memphis area. You know, I know obviously Tuskegee fans and, and, and what they represent. And there is a group of people every year that get together in Memphis to 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 talk about that game and to go down and, and view that game. I did a piece, a story for Grind City Media uh, before the pandemic about and I met with fans from both sides. And, and we were over at uh, Overton Square 
uh, at an establishment there just kicking it and talking about uh, what that game meant and what that rivalry means beyond the game be between the two universities. So it's a good place. It's a great venue. And I'm glad that they're growing and doing whatever they needed to do to bring that back down there. Yeah, and it's so far the – I, I don't think any long-term deal has been reached. I know they're going to play there next year. I think they're in talks trying to figure out the length in the terms of the, the contract. But for certain, next year, or well, not next year, th this coming up football season, October 5th, Tuskegee Morehouse Classic will be returning to Columbus. And that concludes the Morehouse portion of the show, <laughs> I think. I don't know. We're, it's hard to do an HBCU conversation without talking about those fine men down at, at Morehouse. We will try to, on the other side of this, we've got some other uh, topics we're going to get to. You're listening to HBCU Huddle right here in the Built for Tough Studios on Grind City Media. The one anchor spot has been, as you mentioned earlier, Jaron Jackson Jr. It's been the best month of his career, averaging 24.3 points per game. But mm -hmm. now he's realized, I can't be guarded. I really, if you if you clear it out, give me space, he can go with both hands. Hey, Grizzlies fans, be sure to tune in to Grizzby, where the panel and I break down all things Grizzlies and take a look at the rest of the NBA as well. The show is live every Wednesday, 2 p.m. on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. Bain, a corner three. Nothing better. You know, I played in a bunch of different gyms. I'm on the NBA team, of course, and, you know, I'm spoiled. The best fans in the league, for sure. The way that they embrace us, not just here in the building, but, you know, even around the, the gym and around the city, and the love we get is second to none. And that's it. That's a wrap. We out of here. See you next time. This is immaculate. We have some it of the is. detailed pictures. This is amazing. That is like a good shoe. Stunning. Yes. Oh, these are actually 365. Am I getting sold on these? 365. Yes. Stunning. Mm -hmm. Stunning. The box is nice on it. Like, oh, do we man. think these are gonna sell out? Yes. Yes. I think I don't think they're gonna I think they're gonna make a limited run on them, so it won't be like, that shoe this. that. Look at this. And they have yeah. merch too. The Sneak Fest Show live Tuesdays at 2 p.m. on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. I love going to hustle games. You know what everybody doesn't have that they have there that should be, in my opinion, available at all sporting events? The walking taco. You can either get Doritos or Cool Ranch Doritos. Yeah. And then they stuff it with meat, cheese, Fire, lettuce, lettuce, and sour cream. Yep. And it was fire. The Chris Vernon Show, presented by Caesar's Sportsbook, live weekdays at noon on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. Welcome back in, everybody. HBCU Huddle, CJ, Built for Tough Studios, Mike, uh, Kelvin yes, Sampson, sir. one of the best men's college basketball coaches in America, uh, had a, an interesting uh, wardrobe uh, T-shirt on. It said a racism on the front of the T-shirt. He At the end of the game, he talked to some media members about why he chose to wear that t-shirt let's hear what he had to say and then i want to get your thoughts you know racists aren't going to change they're going to be racists until they die you know but uh you may catch somebody on the fence and those are the people that that we make and make a difference with and that's why i want us to continue doing this uh every year and um um uh, I want the Black Coaches Association at the Final Fours to stand for something. And um, uh, I want more black athletic directors. I want more black administrators. I want more black people in power. I want more people of color in power. So we can have, have uh, more opportunities for people that deserve it. For those of you who don't know, that is Kelvin Sampson, head coach at Houston he is one of the winningest coaches in men's D1 college basketball history. One of 68 coaches with over 700 wins. Uh, 52nd all-time in wins. By the time this season ends, hell, probably by the time you watch this show, he should be top 50 in, or he could be top 50 in that category. He's won coach of the year in the Big Eight and in the Pac-10. For those of you who might not remember, the Pac before the Pac-12 
became the Pac-12. They were the Pac-10. Before the Big 12 became the Big 12, they were the Big 8. He's That's how long he has been coaching. Coach of the Year in the American Athletic Conference as well. Mike, when when you saw the video, what went through your mind? You know, it was it was something where I, I had a chance to, you know, sit beside uh, Kelvin Sampson, Coach Sampson, at a uh, awards banquet uh, where he was being honored. Uh, Adrian Wojnarowski was being honored. Um, Doris Burke uh, was being honored. Uh, it was a sports banquet that, that was ha- uh, held in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, a few years ago. And he, I, I just happened to be nominated for an award, a regional award that year, and I was placed at his table. And... You know, it felt really, really authentic and genuine uh, who he was and how he was. He was I think he was going from one coaching uh, stop to Houston at that time. And, you know, the the he's never been a guy to shy away from speaking up. And, you know, some of that is a lost art among college coaches now because, you know, the John Thompson's have gone. You know, the John Cheney's have, have gone on. You know, those kind of coaches uh, have moved on. I'm talking about. African American men uh, who stood up and, and came through coaching through uh, an era where it was a lot of discrimination. Uh, they had to fight, claw, and scratch to get the jobs and the profiles that they had, and they felt an obligation to speak up uh, against some of these practices. Now, let me break down uh, where Kelvin was coming from because that same night from that clip, he got tossed out of a game for making another statement of officiating. I think they won that game by 20 over Oklahoma or Oklahoma State, and he stormed off the court uh, up 20. Uh, and got kicked out of the game uh, as he was wearing the shirt. That, that was their coaching shirts that they wore that night. Yeah, There are, according to some research I was able to do after seeing that clip, um, there are only 11% uh, of athletic directors in the NCAA are mm-hmm. African American. 11%. Um, 79% of athletic directors are male. So it's very, very, very low numbers who are African American, period. And it's overwhelmingly uh, male dominated. So it's basically a field dominated by white men, which is so many other areas in this country uh, historically have been and continue to be so. Um, You have to do better. I I think we've sort of evolved, CJ, and I want to hear your thoughts, too, Mm -hmm. on this. We've sort of grown and evolved and are evolving in real time as a country. And we're seeing there are more NBA officials who are females and black now than there ever have been in the NBA. We're seeing uh, African Americans. We talked about quarterbacking. We, t- you know, do with the yeah. anniversary 25th of Doug Williams last yeah. year. Um, but in administrative and executive and ownership levels, those numbers are so stagnant. And it's a good old boys network. You hire who you know. You hire who you're feeling most comfortable with, and and that has to shake up a little bit. I'm not saying put a black man in just to mix up, just to change up the mix. It's got to be qualified. But you have to open up your opportunities to make sure your business reflects what you're basically serving and, and, and you're serving student bodies who are diverse. You're serving athletes who are diverse, the front office and administrators and the executives uh, at that level have to reflect that diversity as well. And 11% just doesn't do 11% black and, and, and uh, 19 or 18 or t- excuse me, 20% female doesn't reflect what we're seeing in these athletic departments. And the issue with that is, that there are problems that arise and you just don't know that they're problems, right? Thinking particularly about the the women in leadership positions at the NCAA um, level. Like that recently, recently we had very, very noticeable differences in how the men basketball players were treated versus their uh, women counterparts, right? We knew it from the, the way that they marketed the tournament, the women weren't allowed to use the name March Madness uh, the during the pandemic for while they were getting ready for the tournament. The men had these lavish uh, weight rooms and the women were working out in basically a room like this with just like jump ropes and a few kettlebells or something like that. You know, and so I think that if you hire a more diverse leadership uh, pool, you can predict these problems. You can address these problems before they become so large and so damning on your organization. So I think that's why there is a very real need for diversity. And Mike, nobody is, you're, you said it, I'm going to echo that sentiment because this is a sentiment that everybody shares, right? Qualified. There are qualified candidates who are black, who are black men, who are black women. 
They are qualified candidates. Go get them. I'm not saying if I apply, like you shouldn't hire me. I'm not qualified. Don't <laughs> bring me in. That makes sense. But I'm not applying. There are yeah. qualified black candidates out there. You have to be willing to step outside of your comfort zone. Mike, you brought it up, the good old boy network. You're hiring people who you know you're hiring this person because mm-hmm. probably you grew up with this person in some way, shape, mm-hmm. or form. And if you want legitimate change to happen, you have to be willing to step outside of your comfort zone when it comes to these hirings and firings. And you have to create an environment where the people you are hiring don't feel like outcasts, don't feel ostracized, feel like they're a part of the group, feel like their their thoughts, their opinions, and the cultures they come from are valued. And one of my, um, and I don't know if it's just, it's, it's not just me. One of the the critiques that I have when we get into these types of conversations is we don't think enough about the, the higher ups, right? We think about the grand picture and I'll take integration for example. Oh, we love we we thought about that from hey, we got to get these black kids in these schools, but we didn't think hey, you know what else we should probably put in these schools? We probably need to put black teachers and black principals and assistant principals and counselors and things of that nature in these schools instead of having all of our black kids or a large swath of our black kids at that time walking into such a hostile environment. We got to put a culture around them to allow them to be the most successful. And I think that when we when we talk about things like this, as it pertains to coaching, as it pertains to like quarterback, you brought up the black quarterback thing. We don't think a lot about, OK, great. We've got forward facing black people. We got black people we can look at and recognize. But what about the black general managers? Right. Mm-hmm. That's why Holmes mm-hmm. is such a big deal in Detroit. What about the black athletic directors? That's why mm-hmm. Ward Manuel at uh, Michigan is such a big deal to me. Right? Like, what, what about those types of things? Because those are the people who really have the power to in, inject some sort of cultural shift and change for various programs and franchises, and that is very, very important. I think Coach Sampson hit the nail on the head with that statement. No, he, he, he did. He did. And, you know, to, to further your point, too, uh, as you were speaking, you know, one other thing came to mind as well. Um, we have to, as African Americans, uh, we have to be willing to go to places that aren't necessarily the top eight places where we're most populated, right? We got to be willing to go beyond Detroit, Atlanta, LA, Baltimore, DC, you know, Dallas, you know, Houston, um, you know, those kind of places. So if you're if you're an up and coming administrator in college athletics, you might have to go take that assistant athletic director job at Montana State. Right. And, and understand that, hey, you know, this is where my opportunity may be to take that stepping stone so that I can get back and maybe go be athletic director one day at Houston. You know what I mean? From that standpoint. And when, when I speak to college students and, and young professionals all the time, I say, listen, man, one thing you have to be willing to do is be willing to go wherever the opportunity is for you can so you can advance yourself. And it may not always be comfortable. You don't have to go stay in Wyoming forever. But if you could do two years in Wyoming so you can springboard into another position that's in another place that's a little more diverse, that's just part of it. But we can't we can't call and call out the numbers if we're not willing to go and change things up and apply, because the the thing I get back most when we talk about these things is where are the African-American candidates? Yes, there are qualified ones out there, but I can't get this guy or this woman to move from Atlanta. You know, I can't get her to go from Atlanta to South Dakota, right? I, it's, it's impossible because it's not going to be comfortable. Sometimes you got to understand that, look, I got to sacrifice comfort for a couple of years in order to get to a spot where I can build the resume and and, and, and diversify uh, to get to where I want to get to, too. So I'm not saying the onus is on black people to put themselves in uncomfortable positions because we live in uncomfortable positions right. every day. But if you do want to get to the top, the path isn't linear. It's not straight from where you are, staying where you are and climbing a ladder straight up. Sometimes it's a zigzag and getting into different communities and areas where you might not normally have have, have been thinking about going in order to take advantage of those opportunities as well. Word spread. And if you're a place uh, you you brought up the Montana's in the Pacific, was that Pacific Northwest? That's big sky country, right? You brought up big Mm -hmm. sky country. Mm -hmm. If, if you've got a culture that is accommodating and accepting and that values different people coming through, that word travels and, and spreads. And I get why 
um, some people are a bit cautious about going to one of those those types of places because it it does it does not feel good. Mike, you've been in this place. I'm I'm sure where you've been the only one like you in a room. I spent mm-hmm. uh, five years in a, at a high school where it was me and like five other black kids in my graduating class. It was like mm-hmm. thirty black kids total in the school. That was not fun. That was not enjoyable. I get saying, hey, you know what? I'll just I'll just take my chances where I'm I'm at. Again, it is like everything. Mm-hmm. There's not one uh, issue. There's not one standalone way of addressing it. Yes. As a black person, you have to be willing to take some of these jobs and less attractive, less glamorous markets. Mm-hmm. But those jobs have got to got to got to also make sure that the culture is one that is welcoming and inclusive and isn't going to add to a feeling of isolationist or or aloneism that will very likely exist if all you've known your entire life is living in a diverse community or living in a majority black community yeah 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 and you know again like i said and well said well said so the onus it's 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 not the same on every level but there's also some responsibility and, and some open mindedness that's needed across all levels. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, again, like I, as you were saying this and as we were talking about, it, I keep thinking Rick George, the athletic director at Colorado, had to get out of his comfort zone in order to go get a guy like Prime. Now, of course, it bought numbers, it bought attention, it mm-hmm. bought everything that benefited Colorado. But Boulder wasn't necessarily a place that that thrived on having uh, brash, outspoken, in your face, uh, uh, af- African American athletes that that had to make it uncomfortable. There was it was incentivized uh, to do that, but in, in, but they also created an environment that se- that made it welcoming. But you also got to step in your own boldness and, and and know that look, I can impact this place too. And if you have an opportunity, hey, let's look at it. But to Kelvin Sampson's uh, point is is there? Racism is always going to be here. And I thought he was eloquent when he said. You're not going to do anything about the guys that are already hardcore in their beliefs. And that's just going to be racist no matter what. But there are some people who are on the fence. There are some people who are are, are politically swayed and socially swayed based on their experiences every single day. And, and those are the ones that you want to try to make sure, hey, hear this out before you go do this. Uh, let's offset some of these messages that are out there. So I applaud him for wearing the shirt, for being outspoken. And uh, there's a place uh, and there's a platform to do that. And Kelvin came from a genuine place when he did it. Use his for that same message. Absolutely, absolutely. You brought up some some great black college basketball coaches from the the way back, right? You brought up mm-hmm. uh, John Thompson. Why am I blanking on my man from Temple? Cheney. Cheney. Cheney, Cheney. brought up Coach Cheney. Coach Cheney. Um, mm-hmm. Coach Coach Sampson has been coaching since 1987. Guess mm-hmm. who his coaching colleagues were? Right? Mm-hmm. It was Sampson. It was Cheney. It was that guard. It was the the older guard of of black coaches who came through at a time when it was we think is not a whole lot of athletic yeah, directors George and Rattling, coaches George now was yep. it, it, it was wasn't yeah. it was it was just them that was yeah. it yeah. um and so he's got some of that to him and i i think that his influence and impact on some of the newer coaches in college basketball is uh will be a good one and i am encouraged by by him and man my man can flat out coach so that that also helps. You can you can do things like that when you are one of the best in your field. And he's got that Houston team rolling. Mike, let's get to our uh, culture maker segment. Let's talk about Miss Aisha Rasko, host of Weekend Edition Sunday on NPR. She's a former NPR White House correspondent. She is a Howard alum uh, and she's a former editor of the Howard newspaper, The Hilltop. She is the editor of HBCU Made, Mike. You sent this in, and for those of you who don't know what HBCU Made is, it is a, I guess we call that an anthology of mm-hmm. stories um, from various HBCU alumni, which sounds like a great book, Mike. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And, um, you know, when, when I heard of some of the, uh, you know, obviously um, it, 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 the, the list goes on and on and on in terms of how many people submitted essays or she interviewed directly to tell their stories and their experience from Kamala Harris. You know, you got, you know, Spike Lee, um, you Roy know, Wood Jr. Oprah, Roy Wood, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that book is is basically a Bible for 
what these people went through and made of themselves having gone the HBCU journey, uh, respectively across the country. And, um, you know, I would love one day to contribute to a second volume of that book. <laughs> uh, you were telling me yesterday that, that, that you were kind of affiliated with it in some kind of way. Too, I figured so. it out, Mike. I was yeah. not affiliated with this at all. I did do some Tuskegee's doing this. So Tuskegee okay. is doing something like this where instead of all HBCUs, it is just Tuskegee, though. And so yeah. I contributed to that. I, mm. I was not famous enough or important enough to be in the big book. But I answered an email uh, that was sent to me by uh, somebody interested at Tuskegee. And so I, I do think I'm, I'm in that one. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But hopefully. And, and- and the thing is, it's such a great recruiting tool. Mm-hmm. And I would almost I would almost want to buy, you know, two dozen copies, 50 copies of that book and and go to some of our local schools, man. And, 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 and just and drop have, them off and, and drop them off and, and just share your story, share our stories of, of what it means. And, hey, as you're considering, you know, your college choices, look at where some of these people went and came from. And, and look into it. It might be a better fit. And you know what I mean? And because, who you know, HBCU, you don't have to go to an HBCU to become ultimately what you were destined to be. Mm-hmm. But what I will say is that it doesn't uh, it doesn't hurt you. It, I think it builds even more characteristics in you when you go to an HBCU, because I think it underscores a knowledge of self and awareness of self and how you place yourself in the world. I think that's what HBCUs help our students do. And, um, you know, that's why it's important for us to continue to do use our platform at Grind City Media to have the HBCU huddle so we can have a platform to share our stories, but also to reach the next generation, man. And I know you and I are both doing that work, you know, with our own families and beyond to make sure they have at least exposure to options uh, beyond what they may have already imagined. Absolutely. Absolutely. So go check that book out. HBCU made. She's also going on tour in select cities. Um, Atlanta, D.C., and a few others. So if you're in one of those cities, definitely swing by and check her out. And that'll do it for this week's HBCU Huddle. We'll talk to you again next week. We'll have so much more news because the news just doesn't stop for HBCU uh, culture and, and sports. For Mike, I'm CJ. Everybody, y'all take care.